CEI is a free market group, and that pet project, Death by Regulation, is one that we are especially focused on. That is, regulations that literally and directly do kill people. We think this is very important because advocates of more regulations always claim that they are the ones concerned with human safety, with human life, whereas we, the free market opponents, are only concerned with dollars and cents. I think at a gut level, at a fundamental level, that is very false. But I think what death by regulation shows is that even at the most direct visible level, that is false. The fuel economy standards, for example, um, that were described as one CEI victory, um, we thought when we won that case, that would be the end of this program, which is popularly known as CAFE, Corporate Average Fuel Economy. It is not the end of that program. That program is stronger than ever, largely because of the whole global warming agenda, that is fuel economy standards are becoming more and more stringent, which means their toll in terms of increasing traffic fatalities is becoming deadlier and deadlier. If fuel economy standards were a private product, uh, responsible for killing just a fraction of the number of people they kill, they would have been banned overnight by Congress. But because this is a congressional project, a federal project, it has not been banned. It is, in fact, accelerating. FDA, on a different part of death by regulation, is a large part of this project as well. And I'm sorry to say that I think FDA is going to be becoming a much bigger part of that problem as well. FDA is one incredibly powerful agency. Overall, about 25% uh, of every consumer dollar is spent on a product regulated by FDA. And most recently, FDA got jurisdiction over something it has long wanted to go after, namely tobacco, under what's known as the Kennedy-Waxman bill. Now, the question of whether if tobacco is a drug, what is the disease it's supposed to be treating? That's an interesting question. I'll leave that aside maybe for the Q&As. But note that as big as FDA is, as powerful as it is, uh, it, it is getting much, much bigger. And one sort of depressing thing about this is that um, when you look at FDA regulation of medical drugs, medical devices, there really is very, very little litigation against it. Uh, that's not something you see with other regulatory agencies. Department of Transportation gets sued by car companies, for example. Uh, the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, sometimes gets sued by financial companies. With FDA, very few companies uh, sue them. We were involved in one suit against them. Another group, Watch and Legal, was involved in another. Those are exceptions. The reason companies do not sue them is they know that, yes, even if they succeed in overturning, an FDA delay or denial of one specific medical drug or device, even if they win that, every other application they put before that agency for yet another drug or device will go on a, the, at the, to the bottom of the list. They might win that case. It's going to be suicide, though. Basically, uh, in this country, no new medical drug or device can be made available until FDA has passed on both its safety and its efficacy. The research on that safety and efficacy is not done by FDA, it's done by the company, the actual manufacturer, but it's up to FDA to make that uh, decision. And there's one question I want you to hold in your minds while I go through this issue, and it's this. If FDA approves a drug that will start saving lives tomorrow, then how many people died yesterday waiting for FDA to act? I think that it's an unavoidable fact that people did die if this is, in fact, a life-saving drug or device. And when I say how many people died yesterday, I really mean it's more a matter of months and, in many cases, years. Answering that question, I think, is one of the key aspects of really evaluating what's going on with FDA. But we've, before we get into these life and death issues, I want to start with a little story, a true story, involving someone by the name of John Nestor. Now, does anyone here recognize that name? A few folks. Okay. You are the people that I am really asking not to give away the punchline. <laughs> Back in 1984, John Nestor became very popular, notoriously popular in Washington, D.C., because he had this strange habit of driving. He would get into the left lane of the Beltway set his cruise control at 50 miles per, 55 miles per hour, the speed limit, and thus continue driving in that lane 
no matter what happened behind him. He had cars backing up, trucks zooming right up to him, cars swerving around him on the right, drivers giving him the finger. Didn't matter. 55 miles per hour was the law. He had the right to drive at 55 miles per hour, and he just liked the left lane. This caused an incredible furor. I think the Washington Post received more letters in response to that article than on any other topic. And the term to nestorize uh, actually became a verb, that is to infuriate people by some habit. And when I first heard about John Nestor, I thought, you know, this guy is a pretty good metaphor for the Food and Drug Administration. That is, they stick to the letter of the law no matter how many people could be saved, how many lives could be helped if they just, it, it just bent things a bit and approved something a bit faster. You know, great metaphor. And then it turns out, not only was John Nestor a metaphor for the FDA, he actually worked at FDA. <laughs> he worked in their cardiorenal pulmonary division. And um, several years before, in 1972, he had been kicked out of that division because his division had not approved a single new chemical entity in the four previous years. Unlike any other division at FDA, unlike any other medically advanced country, Nestor, John Nestor's division did not approve a single new drug. His driving habits, I think, were the mirror image of his regulating habits. The Ralph Nader people, by the way, hailed him as a hero. They claimed he had been protecting the public. So uh, you can't really discuss FDA without discussing uh, thalidomide. Uh, back in 1957, thalidomide was introduced uh, in Germany, it quickly spread across Europe. It was a very exceptionally non-toxic sedative. It proved to be incredibly useful uh, for treating pregnant women for morning sickness. In 1960, a U.S. company applied to market here in the U.S., and the application landed on the desk of a relatively new reviewer at FDA, Dr. Frances Kelsey. And she had basically 60 days. If she did not do anything within 60 days under the laws that stood then, the Lidomite's application would have been approved, but she had some suspicions that uh, this drug might be causing uh, peripheral nerve damage. And so she began to investigate and uh, did not approve it in 60 days. By the time she finally did get more evidence on that issue, a number of months had passed and reports started coming in from Europe that in fact thalidomide, if taken I think during the first trimester of pregnancy, caused terrible, terrible fetal deformities, missing limbs and deformed limbs. And so, thanks to Dr. Kelsey's actions, thalidomide never was approved in the U.S. Now, uh, I think there's no doubt that Dr. Kelsey was responsible for th this huge uh, a a benefit for public health in this country. I think, though, there are some questions about whether this was more a matter of skill or of luck. Because she was investigating peripheral nerve damage, the real issue with thalidomide was uh, uh, fetal deformity. And a number of other countries whose medical approval systems were just as advanced as that of the U.S., such as Sweden, had passed, had allowed thalidomide uh, uh, to be made available. But in this country, uh, Dr. Kelsey did not, thank God. She received a Distinguished Service Award from President John Kennedy. Just this past Wednesday, she received the first uh, Francis Kelsey Award from the head of uh, FDA itself. She's 96 at this point. And she did deserve those awards, awards. But there's a message that went out as a result of that, that FDA, rather than trying to restrain, has actually been pushing. And the message is, if you're faced with a decision on a drug or device, you're better off taking your time. You're better off being absolutely sure. Absolutely sure. Now, um, I think that approach can backfire. And to illustrate that, I want to play a 60-second um, uh, radio ad that we produced quite a few years back. Uh, it's still occasionally aired. Jeremy? Yeah. Hey. Hey. Man, Uncle Bear! Hang on, I've got a rope! Hold it, what do you think you're doing? What do you mean? That guy's gonna drown if I don't get him this rope. Rope? Let me see the paperwork on it. Paperwork? But he's drowning! Hey. I don't care what his condition is. He can't have that rope till I say it's safe. So get me the files. Yes, sir, but... Okay, now put a tensile strength meter on it, and let's see what it'll hold. But Better safe than sorry. So that checks out, too, and there's minimal fraying as well. Okay, we're ready. 
Ahoy out there! The rope I'm about to throw you meets all federal standards. Hello? Hello? When it comes to approving new medical drugs and devices, the federal government's overcaution can be deadly. Think about this. If the government approves a drug that will start saving lives tomorrow, then how many people died yesterday waiting for the government to act? Hello? Hello? A message from the Competitive Enterprise Institute, Washington, D.C. Call 202-331-1010. That's, thank you. Um, there's a reason we don't look at the paperwork on a, on a life rope before we toss it over to someone who needs it. Um, and yet I want to take you through a number of cases where I think FDA does exactly that and explain why it's not just a question of this one historical episode involving thalidomide that explains why FDA acts like this. It's really a fundamental question of how politics and journalism works. First, on an ethical level, bear in mind that approving a drug and disapproving a drug are not opposite sides of the same coin. There's a huge difference between them. If FDA approves a drug or device, it does not force anyone to use it. If it disapproves a drug or device, it does not allow anyone to use it. That, I think, is a huge gulf. There's no reason to think that, you know, there's just these two equivalents that have to be balanced off. But more fundamentally, in terms of politics, if you work at FDA, there are two sorts of mistakes you can make in reviewing a, a drug or device application. On the one hand, you can approve a drug that turns out later, in retrospect, to be a disaster, such as thalidomide. And if you do that, it, there's no doubt that from a medical standpoint, people suffer, people may die. On the other hand, if you disapprove a drug that is badly needed by people, people might also suffer and die, namely the ones who really need that and have no good alternative. So from a medical standpoint, the results of those two mistakes are really equivalent. In both cases, the mistake can lead to suffering and death. But from a political and journalistic standpoint, there is a huge difference, an incredible difference. If you make the first sort of mistake of approving a drug that later turns out to be a very bad drug, the victims often are very, very visible. They or their families know what happened to them and why. Their stories make front page news. Their testimony in Congress is dynamite. On the other hand, in the second type of mistake, where you delay a drug or deny a drug that is really, really needed, you also have victims, but they don't know what's happened to them. Unless they're the one in a million family that's been following medical research and knows somewhere at FDA there's something that could help us, except for those rare instances, those victims do not know that they are victims of FDA. All they know is their doctors told them, we can't do anything more for you. Those victims are politically and journalistically invisible. And so in terms of what this means for FDA, it's a world of difference. It's a world of difference. Let me give you two examples. Uh, and, and these are uh, classic examples, and they're a little old, but they're not the only examples. I'll go through newer ones as well. In the late 1960s, beta blockers became uh, uh, became the, the, the treatment of choice for people at risk of a second heart attack in Europe. In this country, however, FDA's thinking went as this. People taking beta blockers are going to be taking them on a daily basis for the rest of their lives. We want to make sure they're not carcinogen, uh, uh, carcinogenic. We're going to subject them to double the number of animal tests we usually require for carcinogenicity. In a sense, FDA was telling, and so beta blockers were delayed for about eight or nine years before they entered the US. In a sense, FDA was telling people who were at risk of dying any week from a second heart attack, we're worried that you might have a tumor 10, 20 years down the line, which is a risk that lots of these people would gladly have taken. About nine years later, in the early 70s, the FDA commissioner, Arthur Hull Hayes, gets up at a press conference and says, today we are announcing our first approval of a new beta blocker. If the European evidence is at all clear, we're, is, is at all uh, valid, we're gonna, this will save 10 to 20,000 lives a year. Even if it's only half as effective, we'll be saving 5 to 10,000 lives a year. It was hailed as a great FDA achievement. The question was if it was going to start saving five to 10,000 lives per year in the year after 
Dr. Hayes' pronouncement, what does that mean as far as the loss of life before that announcement? And the answer is you had, FDA had a huge number of deaths to account for. But now I want to get to this point about invisible victims. Is there anyone here who has ever seen, who has ever not seen a photo of a thalidomide victim? I suspect you all have. Is there anyone here who has ever seen a photo of a victim of FDA's nine-year delay on beta blockers? Anyone at all? That is, someone who died because they could not get a hold of beta blockers in the U.S. for nine years. I certainly haven't. That's what I mean by the difference between visible and victims, visible victims versus invisible victims. The pressure to avoid another thalidomide episode is always there. The pressure to avoid another beta blocker episode, well, maybe it's recognized by a few people, maybe some give it lip service, but as far as a visual photo of what we're talking about, it is absolutely invisible. And that's why, for example, um, quite a while back, one former FDA commissioner said the following, in all my years at FDA, I've been unable to find a single instance where we've had a, con a congressional committee investigate our failure to approve a drug. But the times when we've had committee hearings on, that criticized our approval of a drug are countless. In short, the message to the FDA staff is clear. There's pressure for negative action on new drug applications. Let me give you a somewhat more recent example. Interleukin-2 was approved in 1992 by FDA as the first therapy for advanced kidney cancer, which kills about 10,000 people per year, per 10, people per year and is invariably fatal. By the time FDA approved it, FDA sat on the application for three and a half years. By the time it, FDA approved it, it had become available in about nine European countries. By FDA's own data, the drug seemed to benefit 15 to 20 percent of the people who took it. Uh, about 10 percent actually went into remissions of more than six months. So what was the hang-up? The problem was that interleukin-2 is a very, very strong drug, and it actually killed 5 percent of the people who took it. And that 5 percent was what FDA was focused on for three and a half years. I've actually looked at transcripts of some of these advisory committee hearings, and you, uh, there was one woman talking about the family member with it and saying, you know, you, you're the committee, you're, you're worried about the side effect of interleukin-2. You forget that advanced kidney cancer has a 100% side effect of death. But that's what they were focused on for three and a half years. FDA's excuse was, well, if anyone really needed it, they could get it from us on compassionate use on some paperwork-bound uh, approval process that very few people know about, even fewer can navigate. I spoke to the head of the American Kidney Cancer Association at that time, Eugene Schoenfeld. His one-word response was garbage. That was actually the polite version of his one-word response. That's the possibility of people getting it. FDA has gone through many, many reforms trying to speed things up. Uh, they had accelerated approval. They had compassionate use. They had parallel tracking. They had surrogate endpoints. They had something called the new drug application rewrite. They made some small improvements, especially once the AIDS crisis hit, when they were actually con confronted by demonstrations outside their offices uh, by uh, people with AIDS and their supporters. This was probably the first time that they were confronted on an organized level by victims of drug delay. And for a while, it seemed things were getting better, though not very, very quickly. But FDA is now claimed, swamped by claims of a totally different sort. They come from uh, folks like Ralph Nader, Sidney Wolf of the Health Research Group, and the claim is every time there's an unexpected adverse side effect from a new drug or device, it shows FDA has become too fast, it's become too sloppy, it's become too cozy with industry. Uh, now, if you want, you know, you can achieve zero unexpected side effects from new drugs. Uh, you can also achieve zero plane crashes. You can achieve zero plane crashes guaranteed by having zero airplane flights. You can get zero unexpected side effects from new drugs, I guarantee you, by having zero new drugs. 
That, however, is an unmitigated public health disaster. But that's really the direction that all this criticism is pushing us towards. Sidney Wolf, for example, if you dig into his history, this is the head of the health research group, back, I think, in the 60s or 70s, he actually opposed the very first generation of uh, fire alarm detectors in homes, because he was worried about the risk from the ionization uh, effects of, of one of the chemicals used there. He'll deny it now. He'll say it was, it was just an unpopular type of smoke detector. It wasn't. It was the, the most popular type. He tried to stop it. Thank God he failed. The claim, another claim is, well, we need to have expanded clinical trials. We need to f put industry's feet to the fire, and we need to know more and more about these drugs before they get let loose on the public. But you know, if you, when you're talking about, in clinical trials, you're studying drugs on uh, several hundred, sometimes several thousand patients. There's only so much you can learn compared to what will happen when they're being used by millions, if not tens of millions of patients. If you really want to know what's going to happen once they become totally available, then you've got to run your trials not on thousands of patients, but on hundreds of thousands or millions of patients. Uh, in the sense, you've got to, you've, you've got to make them available uh, to, you know, to, ha to half of one huge set of the population and see what happens and wait years to get those results. If you require pharmaceutical omniscience of that sort, you're simply not going to get drugs. Or if you get them, they're going to be incredibly, incredibly expensive. What's another claim? Um, that too many drugs are Me Too drugs. They're just copying other drugs. They're just tinkering a little bit. Uh, that's no real improvement. And so, FDA has now slowly begin, begun to surreptitiously sneak in a non-statutory factor for approval, not just safety and effectiveness, but effect superiority to other drugs in the category. Now look, in my view, there's nothing wrong, even if all we're talking about are literally Me Too drugs, there's nothing wrong with them. Uh, one thing they do is lower the price. There are lots of Me Too products on the market. There are lots of Me Too SUVs and Me Too uh, station, well, there aren't that many station wagons. That's fuel economy standards at work. And what they do is they increase consumer choice. They tend to lower price. What Me Too drugs tend to do for physicians is increase choice, and they also turn out quite often to be effective for other parts of the population at risk. You know, two drugs, uh, both effective for 40% of a certain arthritis population may not be effective for the same 40%. It's good to have choices among drugs. Um, and finally, if you look back retroactively, retrospectively, it turns out that for any drug category, the best drug 10 years later is recognized not as having been the very first drug, but the second, third, or maybe fourth drug in that class. If you had stopped approving drugs in that class with the first category, with the very first drug, you would not have gotten those second, third, and fourth drugs. In a sense, you'd be creating a monopoly. Why would you want to do that? Well, because you don't want new drugs. That's why. What else is happening? FDA is now beginning to look more and more at the issue of cost. That, in fact, is very likely to be the debate, uh, I believe, today on a drug that's being considered by an advisory committee called the Vastin for Advanced Breast Cancer. It's a relatively expensive drug. It has benefits, there's very clear benefits according to some doctors, according to others it does not, but it costs money. In Europe, Avastin has already been approved, but the British, uh, what's called the NICE Institute, National Institute on, uh, I think, uh, Clinical Health and Effectiveness, found it was too expensive uh, to utilize. Cost is becoming yet another factor, and you know for certain that with Obamacare, uh, when everyone's cost becomes a national issue, because everyone's health care is a national issue, cost will become even more of a factor. In a sense, if you think health care is expensive now, wait till it's free. What else? You're getting with what are called REMS, risk evaluation and mitigation strategies being formulated, where companies have to agree to this post-marketing surveillance to restricted use and so forth. The latest drug that almost got subjected uh, to REMS, but did not, is any over-the-counter cough medicine con containing dextromethorphan. That was by a vote, a close vote of the advisory committee. The claim was kids are abusing it, we got to do something about it. The Department of uh, DEA, uh, Drug Enforcement Administration, went to FDA and said, do something. The advisory committee thankfully voted not to. 
You also have restrictions being increased on uh, medical devices. There used to be one, there still is one relatively easy way to get a device approved called the 510K process where you show it's pretty equivalent to another device that's already on the market. We should not have to do all the testing that went into that first device. Instead, FDA has a list of about 70 suggestions for improving that process. Each of those suggestions is aimed at tightening it. More and more, we're getting the syndrome for devices of invented here, available elsewhere. Let me go through several other examples quickly. Um, Arcoxia. Uh, available for arthritis, uh, available I think in about 70 different countries around the world, not approved in this country in, in 2007. Provenge, uh, a new type of therapy for prostate cancer, was finally approved in April 2007. It had been delayed for three years while FDA insisted on a second clinical trial that ended up reconfirming the first clinical trial. MEPAC, the drug for osteosarcoma, it's been, it was improved in uh, Europe over a year ago. Here, FDA just demanded a second trial. It's gonna require about 900 patients. In this country, about 900 people a year come down with osteosarcoma. That's what, that's the, the death knell that clinical trials of this relatively small size can mean for drugs in what's called the orphan drug category, dr drugs serving a very, very small number of patients. There is a new test for HIV. Uh, which is much faster in terms of uh, being able to detect it after infection because it picks up not just the antibodies but the antigens as well. FDA approved it in June with a nice press release touting itself. If you did a little digging, you'd find out that test has been available in Europe since 2004. There's a new test for uh, prostate-specific antigen, PSA, useful uh, in, the, in detecting uh, prostate cancer. This new test evidently reduces the number of false positives and goes some ways towards distinguishing between aggressive prostate tumors versus non-aggressive ones. It's not available in this country. It's been available in Europe since 2004. FDA says the company just had, didn't apply until recently. Well, you know, and quite often the claim is made, well, we denied approval because the, the company did a lousy job in its application. You know, if you set up hurdles on, uh, hurdles and potholes on, uh, on the sidewalk leading to your door, uh, and then you're asked, why don't people knock at your door? And your answer is, well, they, they walk, they're clumsy and they keep falling over. I think you're at fault. And that's, that's in the sense, the approach that FDA takes here. Here's another thing that was disapproved, not by FDA, but by a sister agency of FDA at Health and Human Services. It's not a drug. It's a paper checklist, five-step checklist for aimed at reducing catheter-related infections in cardiac intensive care units. So the checklist was being studied by Johns Hopkins and, and the various Michigan hospitals, but because they were looking at results from those who used the checklist and not, this other agency at HHS said, aha, this is human research, you need an institutional review board and you need informed consent. Avandia for type two diabetes, this is a drug that has been a source of controversy for a number of years, for a number of years. And um, what most recently happened, I believe, is that uh, once again, the, the, the advisory committee recommended, uh, this is for type two diabetes. The claim is it increases cardiac risk by, an, uh, by a disproportionate amount compared to other drugs. Some doctors like it, others do not. What's happened is that the black box warnings have been repeatedly strengthened, but the claim is FDA ought to be anchored entirely from the market. And what's been happening here, is, I think, is a new type of bureaucratic infighting where you have dissidents at FDA who never liked the decision. They get overruled at FDA. They take their claims to Congress, especially, especially folks like uh, uh, Congressman Waxman. And their, these committees then release their own studies on this, time to undercut whatever, whatever FDA is about to do. And so they then team up with trial lawyers, they get great stories on, uh, uh, in news on, on television and so forth, and FDA finds itself being totally undercut because it is not willing to engage 
in the same sort uh, of infighting that these folks do. And so on Avandia, I think it's, it's gratifying to see it has not yet been yanked from the market, that instead it's just a question of uh, increasing warnings, but there's no reason to think that that won't continue. Let me get to the last example I'm going to give you. This is something called the uh, cardio pump, manufactured by a small company in Sweden. It was developed in this country, I believe, by a surgeon, a uh, car cardiac surgeon in uh, St. Paul, who heard about an incident where an 80-year-old woman's husband keeled over, having a heart attack. She and her son grabbed a toilet plunger, and Jane Orient, I don't know if we're on a plumbing theme tonight, but <laughs> they grabbed a plunger and used it to administer CPR, and the suction capability of the plunger by pulling up on the person's chest meant they, could, they didn't have to wait for it naturally to recompress. They could yank it up, press back down at a faster rate, and they revived the, the person. This doctor then actually designed something very similar, same principle, but much better designed, um, what you call the cardio pump, and they began to test it in a number of, of ER for amb ambulance systems in the Minneapolis area. FDA decided this is a life or death issue. We're going to categorize this as a class three device, which means you can't, do the, you can't use it unless you have informed consent from patients. Now remember, these are patients who went into cardiac arrest outside the hospital. They're brought, I don't know how you do that. The answer is you don't do that, which is why for a while, at least for a while, this was being used in a number of ambulance systems in cities in Israel and Europe. In this country, this is not permitted, but this is. This is still legal. <laughs> By the way, um, the Washington Times, maybe three years ago, had this picture of um, Hillary Clinton in Jerusalem on the front page, and she was testing some device, and it's described as a device being tested for improving the ability to give CPR. It was this device. It was this device, she's in the Jerusalem hospital doing a photo op. It's not, she couldn't have done that here. Well, she could have, but no one else could have. Okay, so the claims are FDA is too fast. Once, but really the question isn't do we think FDA is too fast or do some policy analysts think FDA is too fast? I think the real question is what do doctors think? And for the last decade or so, CI has been conducting periodically uh, professionally run surveys of various medical specialists. One year oncologists, another year cardiac surgeons, another year neurosurgeons. The basic question being, in your opinion, is FDA too fast or too slow to approve new therapies? The most recent poll that we ran was uh, back in 2007 of orthopedic surgeons. And their essential view was that three quarters set, thought FDA is too slow, 60% believed it hinders their use of new therapies, 73% believe that the approval delays hurt patients, 80% by the way favored having Vioxx back on the market. For all the claims that Vioxx is a me too drug with unnecessarily high side effects, 80% of orthopedic surgeons would like to have Vioxx back on the market. To force on all their patients? No. But because they know that they have certain patients who responded better to Vioxx than they did to anything else in terms of relieving pain, and those patients have not found anything uh, to replace Vioxx since it went off the market. Now, the results that we got from orthopedists in 2007 were by no means uh, unique to orthopedic specialties. Um, on the basic question of whether FDA helps or hinders you in using promising new drugs, orthopedics, ortho, orthopedists at 60 percent, oncologists 44 percent, um, neurologists 45 percent, cardiologists 46 percent, oncologists back in 1995, the first one 43 percent. In some cases, majorities thinking FDA actually hurts their practice of medicine. In other cases, just about an even split with those who think it helps. When you've got an agency 
uh, that's supposed to be protecting the public and you have such an, at best, an even split in specialist opinion of that agency, I think you have trouble. You know, imagine polling folks uh, who call fire departments and half of them think they worsened the fire once they arrived on the scene rather than put it out. Um, in terms of, um, the other results were very similar. On this one question, has the FDA approval process hurt your ability to treat your patients with the best possible care? Frequently, some of the time, at least once or never. Uh, strong majorities every year said it overall hurts. I think the scariest finding we, we got was from cardi uh, oncologists of whom 11% said it frequently hurts their ability to treat patients, frequently. 63% said overall it hurts, but 11% said frequently. Those, I think, are pretty frightening findings, and they come from folks, I believe, that are in the best position to know what they're talking about. So the final question, what can we do about FDA? Just what can we do with this agency? This agency where every time you hear them announce an important new approval, the real question is, what does that mean as far as people having died uh, in the months or years before this announcement. The more important the approval, the bigger the death toll must have been. But once again, that's not the sort of question you hear asked. And the answer, I'd say, is pretty simple, at least in my view. Don't change FDA. Don't alter its criteria for safety and effectiveness. Just take away its veto power. Turn it into an advisory agency, a certifying agency. If it approves a drug, it gets the stamp of approval. And rather than ban outright unapproved drugs, simply allow them to be used with informed consent under medical supervision. In the short run, what that means is that for people who trust FDA, whether they're doctors or patients, life would not change at all. They would only continue using FDA-certified therapies. But for those patients who, for one reason or another, have to go outside the ambit of government-approved drugs and devices, they would have a new option that they do not have now. That would happen in the short term. That would happen overnight. In the long term, I think what would happen is you would see new entities arising in this country in the business of quickly evaluating new drugs and devices. And doctors would pay attention to that. Uh, just as they now pay attention to what their colleagues say or to what medical research journals say or to what's happening in countries where those drugs and devices are already approved. They would not be stumbling around in the dark. They would do what they're always doing. And so, one, you'd have new sources of information in this country. And secondly, FDA would be subject to something it's never been subject to before, namely competition. If FDA did not want to be the very last kid on the block, the very last regulator on the block coming out with its uh, findings, it would have to speed up those findings, and they would have to be credible findings. In a sense, FDA would have to compete, and they would get better at what they do. All you have to do is take away that veto power. Now, we asked people, we asked physicians in our poll what they thought of a proposal under which they, as physicians, could use unapproved therapies, and majorities favored them every year we've done this by 60, 70, 80 percent. This is not an off-the-wall proposal. This is supported by the majority of most, by most of the physicians we surveyed. And there's already something very similar that is going on when it comes to doctors doing stuff that FDA has not approved, other than practicing medicine, thank God. Uh, and that is off-label use. When drugs are approved, they're approved for a specific, specific diseases, sometimes specific populations. Uh, but once they're approved, the doctor is free to put that drug to any use that he or she thinks is, is medically appropriate. And in many cases, off-label use actually becomes the standard of care. About 30 to 50 percent of all chemotherapies are used in an off-label basis. In some cases, it might actually be negligence on the part of a doctor not to use a drug for a certain off-label use. This happens all the time, and in a sense, it's an analogy to what we're talking about here. Now, not coincidentally, off-label use itself is under attack by FDA. FDA has always taken the position that, well, we think we have the power to regulate off-label use. 
even though that constitutes really not drug approval, but practice of medicine. FDA is used. I mean, we believe we have that power, but we're going to be good guys and not use it for the time being. That used to be their approach. More and more, however, they are making noises claiming we're going to be looking into this because is there any reason why anyone should be treated for anything without our being certain that this drug uh, is a good and effective drug or a good and effective device? Uh, so off-label use, uh, I think, is itself becoming an endangered uh, uh, form of practicing medicine. So that is the state of affairs now. Uh, it does not look good for the, in, for the very near future. But um, November is not that far away, and uh, it's Congress here that ultimately uh, calls the shots on this, and so who knows what the future will bring. Thank you.